In 3.1, we're look, going to be looking at characteristics of power and polynomial functions, so really go in more in depth with higher order functions than just linear or quadratic. And we're not going to be going to the graphing calculator because you've noticed we don't ever use the graphing calculator in this course. And so we're going to be looking at the equation and the function itself and being able to describe and pull characteristics from the information that we are giving. So we're really investigating here on what's going on given these equations. And so the first thing I want to recognize is the polynomial, polynomial function. Here is your very basic polynomial function. Although it looks really scary being written like this and all drawn out, I want to emphasize in very generic terms because we're going to be pulling information out. Um, so if you're looking at a polynomial, the biggest exponent we typically call n, and we're going to reference that later. And then the numbers that are in front of your variable, a sub n, a sub n minus 1, a sub 2, etc., is just the coefficient or the large number that's written there. Now, I want to write in very general terms because I'm going to reference n and a sub n as we go through in this entire lecture. So looking at the polynomial, you can see it's written here. Same thing. I just left out some middle terms here. There are certain characteristics we can pull from just looking at the front number. So when I'm looking at a polynomial, the highest degree is considered n, and that's considered the degree of the entire polynomial. So you want to look throughout the entire function and find the biggest exponent. After you find the biggest exponent, you've identified your leading term. So this entire piece here is your leading term. n is the degree of your polynomial, and then that large coefficient in front of it is known as your leading coefficient. Now, in college math courses, and everything's not spoon-fed toward you. It's not in this really nice form like you saw in earlier math classes in high school and middle school. That leading term and leading coefficient may not always be at the front. So make sure you investigate and look through the entire function. Look for the highest degree that you can find. Then we'll be able to recognize the degree and the leading coefficient. So that's what I want to do in these three examples here. I want to make sure that you understand where those pieces are. So looking at the function, f of x equals 3 plus 2x squared minus 4x cubed. My leading term, I'm going to look for my biggest exponent, and it's right here. That's the biggest exponent, 3. So this piece right here would be my leading term. Now I'm going to write it all out in my first examples. Then as I go forward, you're going to notice that I start abbreviating. So my leading term is this full piece here. So if I want to know the degree of this entire polynomial, it's going to be the exponent that's on it. So that would be degree 3. So it's just going to be your n. You'll notice the degree that's here. And then after that, I want to find my leading coefficient. So looking for the leading coefficient, that is the large number that's attached to your variable, my leading coefficient in this case would be negative 4. So again, your leading coefficient is that a sub n value that's attached to your biggest exponent. So make sure that you're able to recognize the leading term. You can notice this one was in the back versus this one was in the front. The highest exponent is your degree. So I did 3, not 2. My leading coefficient is that negative 4. Don't forget the negative. Looking at the next one, you want to look for your largest exponent. We see it right here with the fifth power. So that's my leading term. Then I want to find my degree. So I'm just going to write D. So my degree would be this exponent, so 5. And my leading coefficient would be 5 as well. Just coincidental, not always true. So if I look at my next function here, again, I want to look throughout the entire thing and look for the leading coefficient or the highest exponent. You can see it was in the back here, it was at the front here. You're not guaranteed to have it at any particular place. This would be my leading term. So my degree of this polynomial would be the largest exponent, so it would be 3. And my leading coefficient would be negative 1. If there's no number here, there's an assumed 1. You're not just going to put a negative. It's going to be a negative 1. And you want to make sure you keep the negative with it like you see on example A and C. So we're just kind of slowly rolling here, looking at some basics. So part A, that's a polynomial function. That's the degree, that's the lead term, that's the leading coefficient. Another characteristic we get from this is something called continuous. All polynomial function, you'll notice again, all the way back up here, n is going to be a positive integer. So that means it's going to be numbers like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, et cetera, et cetera. It's not going to be 2 thirds. It's not going to be a negative. It's not going to be a square root. 
So if I'm looking at polynomials and they have all those positive integers, they're also known to be continuous. Continuous is defined as no breaks, holes, or gaps. And so I like to do a good example and a bad example so you can kind of see a little bit of both. So you can see here, this would be a continuous function. If I were drawing it, I could draw it without picking up my pen. So sometimes that's how I define continuous. Can you draw it without picking up your pen or pencil? You can see here, this is not a continuous function. If I go to draw this, I'm going to have to come down, go up, pick up my pen, and then start back up here. So there's definitely a huge break or gap right here. So this would not be a continuous function. Another characteristic is not only is it continuous, but it's smooth, meaning it has rounded terms. Notice here, if I were drawing this, I have rounded terms. I can smooth. It's continuous. This is definitely a polynomial function. Notice here, if I come down, all of a sudden I have a sharp turn. Look, I have a corner on it. This would not be an example of a polynomial. It is not smooth. It does not have rounded turns. And if you notice, too, this is your parent function, y equals x, the absolute value of x. So you can see, even look at the equation, it doesn't have anything to the n power. So this is definitely not a polynomial. It's an important function, and we've worked with this function, but it doesn't fit into the classification of a polynomial function of degree n. It is not smooth, although it is continuous. The last characteristic is something known as turning points. A polynomial of degree n will have at most n x-intercepts and n minus 1 turning points. So notice this function here. They just gave us a graph. We're not always going to have a graph, but I think visually you need to understand what turning points are. So I want to show you a graph. You can see that it has 1, 2, 3 x-intercepts. So this was a degree 3 function. And it has n minus 1 turning points, so it would have two turning points, meaning a point where it turned from increasing to decreasing or decreasing to increasing. You can see it's going up, and then right here it started going down, and right here it started going up again. So it had two turning points. I also like to consider just what we know about y equals x squared, because we worked a lot with y equals x squared in unit 2. Looking at the polynomial function y equals x squared, well, we know this is degree of 2. It's the only exponent we even have. So that means at most or maximum amount, we would have two x-intercepts. And we know this is true because we factored in a quadratic formula. We solved so many problems that was a quadratic and we got two answers. At most, sometimes we only got one. And so that means if I'm looking at how many turning points, spell that correctly there, turning points in this quadratic function, it would be 2 minus 1, so 1 turning point. We can also clearly see that, because I'm just going to look at my parent function. You're pretty good with the parent functions by now, y equals x squared. You can see it would be going down, and then right here, it would start going up again, so it had 1 turning point. We also know that to be our vertex. We just tested over that in unit two. And so interesting things are happening here. And I don't want to graph everything we do. If you've been using a graphing calculator, I think you're hurting yourself as you move forward on the exam because you cannot use those on an exam. So let's look at these two examples of just equations, no graphs, and see if we can pull this information out. So it says, without graphing the function, determine the local behavior of the function by finding the maximum number of x-intercepts and turning points. So the first thing we have to do is we have to find the degree. Again, I'm going to write out all the words for the first example, and I'll abbreviate in a second. So I need to find the biggest exponent, and it's right here. So that is my leading term from page 1. My degree would be the largest exponent, so I have degree 10. Remember, that's your n value. What are the maximum number of x-intercepts? So x-intercept-wise. Again, that's your n value, so there's 10 maximum. Again, another reason you can't just run to a graphing calculator and do this, because it may not end up having 10 intercepts, but at most it could have 10. And then how many turning points can it have? It can have n minus 1 turning points. So I'm going to take my n to be 10 minus 1, and I get 9 turning points. 
Now, I, I'm aware in practicing it and taking exams, you don't necessarily have to write 10 minus 1. But as we're working through this, I want to emphasize where does that minus 1 come from? It comes from that n minus 1 on the previous page. Take your degree, subtract 1. That's how many turning points you would have. So let's look at part B. And again, I'm going to abbreviate on part B. Without graphing the function, determine the maximum number of x-intercepts. So I'm going to look for the maximum number of x-intercepts and turning points for this function. So the first thing we have to do is find that leading term. Where's the biggest exponent? Now I'm not looking for the biggest number. I'm aware, 108 is the biggest. I'm looking for the biggest exponent and it's right here. It has an exponent of 12. So that means my degree would be 12, that's my n. And remember, if you're looking at ax to the n, n is your highest exponent. So that means how many maximum x-intercepts could I have? Well, I could have 12. Again, it's your n value, the same as that. And then turning points, I'm going to abbreviate here, turning points is going to be n minus 1. So it would be 12 minus 1. So 11 turning points. Again, we're not solving really in-depthly like we were doing in previous sections. We're not looking for x values. We're looking for what can we figure out given this equation about characteristics of a polynomial. Now for part E, E is going to help us so we can do our very last thing, which I think is the hardest of the section. If we're looking at any function, let's just consider the parent function, f of x equal to x to the n, where n is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, da, 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 da. As n becomes greater, it is going to become flatter at the origin. So I'm going to piece that apart. If n is even, such as is x squared, x to the 4th, x to the 6th, x to the 8th, you're going to notice that it is similar to your x squared. So if you know your parent functions, you know what it's similar to. And you can see here from the graph, like here's my x squared, and then my x to the 4th, x to the 6th, x to the 8th, and you can see it's getting flatter and flatter at the origin. More importantly, notice the shape of it. This end behavior, you can see everything's going up on both sides. So it's very similar to an x squared. Now, obviously, working with our reflections and transformations and shifts, it's, you know, it could take on some other attributes. But knowing that all of your even-powered functions are going to be similar to your x squared, it's going to help us with the next piece. So look at this. If n is odd, notice it is similar to your x cubed, another parent function we've been working with. And so I graphed x cubed, x to the fifth, x to the seventh, x to the ninth, and I said, let me just look at all these odd functions. What's going on with them? You'll notice here is this darkest line. This is my x cubed, and then x to the fifth, x to the seventh, x to the ninth. You'll notice it's getting flatter and flatter at the origin, but notice that end behavior. Notice out here they're all going up on the right, and they're all going down on the left. That's important because we're going to use that fact that they are similar to my quadratic, similar to my cubic, to help me figure out the end behavior of my functions. So let's look at part two. So there's that polynomial we've been working with. It says if n is odd. So the highest exponent, if it's n, if it is odd, remember we just said, so we're looking at the highest exponent of the whole function. You notice in all these examples, I never looked at anything else. So I'm looking at the degree n of the function. And if the degree is odd, it's going to be real similar to y equals x cubed. So that means if a sub n, the number in front of it, is positive, it's going to be similar to y equals x cubed. Remember what that looks like? It looks like one arm up, one arm down. So that means the graph is going to fall to the left and rise to the right. Now I love this terminology here. Your book likes to go a little bit more professional with its notation. So what you want to do is you want to kind of sketch out what it is similar to. So I can see that it's going as it's going this way, it's going up, as it's going to the left, it's going down. So then when I go into the book's notation, as x goes to negative infinity going this direction, f of x is going to negative infinity. As x goes to positive infinity, f of x is going to positive infinity. This is how you're going to be answering the question. More specifically, this piece right here is how you're going to have to answer it. But this looks scary. This looks hard. So my best thing to tell you is to say sketch it, know what it's similar to, and then notice your end behaviors. So if I come over here, another little trick I have, notice 
if I connect the left and right hand behavior, see how it looks like it's going up like a linear function, like a positive linear function? That also helps me when I have a positive a sub n to realize which arm is going up and which arm is going down. So let's look at the reverse of that, part two. What if a sub n is negative? Well, it's still odd. Remember, we were talking about n is odd here. So if it's odd and has a negative in front of it, that would be something similar to a y equals negative x cubed. So that means it's going to be just reflect it. We talked about that transformation in unit two. So that means the left is going to be going rising to the left. It's going to be falling to the right. Notice if I connect that left and right, it kind of makes a negative linear function. So that kind of helps me realize which arm is up, which arm is down. And so once I kind of rough sketch it out, then I can answer this piece right here. As x is going to negative infinity, you can see it's going to positive infinity on your f of x. Or remember, f of x is a nickname for y. As it's going to the right or to positive infinity, f of x is going to negative infinity. So as we kind of work through um, the examples, I'm going to, again, recommend look for what the degree is, what the a sub n is, sketch it what it's similar to. Odd ones are going to be similar to x cubed. Think about your reflections. Looking at your sketch, it's easier to get this notation here. So that's the odd. Let's look at even. We just stated two pages ago that when we're looking at the even one, it's going to be similar to y equals x squared. And so notice is a sub n is greater than zero or positive, it's going to be similar to the parent function itself. And we know that parent function looks like this, so it's going to rise left, rise right. Therefore, you'll notice it has the same n behavior. f of x is going to positive infinity on both of them. Now, if we look at n being negative, n even, and negative, it's going to be similar to negative x squared. So that means it just reflects downward like this. So you can see the graph falls to the left, falls to the right. So as x goes to negative infinity, you're answering this part here. f of x, both of them are going to be going to negative infinity. So your notes are going to be really helpful, page 4 and 5 from your notes, to help you with problems such as this. So let's put all the information from 3.1 together. So the example says to find all the information about it, and it's just going to depend on what it asks you, but I want to look for everything we've done here. First thing I want to do is I want to look for degree. The degree of this polynomial, I want to look for my leading term, which is my highest exponent. So my degree is my n, so it would be 3. The maximum number of x-intercepts, again, is n, so it's also 3. My leading coefficient, leading coefficient is a sub n. That number in front of my variable, and that's negative 1. You can't just say negative. You have to say negative 1. And how many turning points do I have? Again, I'm going to write out all the words on part 1, but 2 and 3, I'm going to abbreviate these words. Turning points, remember, is n minus 1. So I'm going to say 3 minus 1, so 2. Now let's do that hard part. Let's do the n behavior. What is the n behavior of this function? As x goes to negative infinity and x goes to positive infinity, we'll consider this is actually negative x cubed. And we know negative x cubed to look like this. Remember, it was a reflection of the parent function. So it's rising on the left, falling on the right. So as f of x, as it goes to negative infinity, it's going to be going up. So f of x is going to go to positive infinity. As it's going to positive infinity, f of x is going to be going down, so negative infinity. So again, make sure you sketch it out so you understand, and you can kind of see pictorially what's going on with that end behavior. For number two, I'm going to abbreviate a little bit as we go, but I'm still going to be looking for all this information. I'm just going to abbreviate. So I'm going to look for the degree. Remember, it's the leading term, so look for your highest exponent. That would be right here. So my degree would be four. I remember that's your n. I want to next look for my x-intercepts. I have at most four, same as your degree. My leading coefficient is that large number attached, so two. And then how many turning points do I have? I have four minus one, so three turning points. Now for the end behavior. 
probably the most difficult part of this section, but doable. Since this is an even power or even degree, I know it's either going to look like y equals x squared or negative x squared. Since 2 is positive, I know it's going to be similar to this, so it's going to be going up on the left and right. So as x goes to negative infinity and x goes to positive infinity, what does f of x look like? They're both going up, so both positive infinities. So sketching a little picture is going to be really helpful um, so you can understand and see what's going on and then glance at it. Again, I didn't go to my graphing calculator and type in 2x to the fourth minus 2x squared plus 40. I'm not looking at this. I'm looking at what I know. It's even. It's going to be similar to a quadratic. And then writing my notation from there. Next one. I'm going to say, okay, what's the degree? Look for the biggest exponent, and it's right here. So degree is 6. X-intercept is at max 6. The lead coefficient is 1 half. It's just that number attached to it. So the turning point would be 6 minus 1, so 5 turning points. What is the end behavior? So I need to look at x going to negative infinity, x going to positive infinity. And in order to help me to answer this part here, I'm going to think, okay, it is even. So it's either going to be like an x squared or a negative x squared. Because it's positive, I'm not concerned it's a 1 half, just positive or negative. So positive is going to look like this. So they're both going to be going to positive infinity. I hope this helps as you complete section one. Just feel free to canvas message me if you have any questions or concerns along the way.